This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 206, recorded on November 9th, 2012. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. This episode of TWIV is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio... Dixon de Palmier. Oh, Vincent. I can hear you breathing. I am breathing. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what my wife told me last night. <laughs> How are you, Dixon? I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Good to have you back. It's been months, right? It well, it's been several weeks, that's for sure. Have you been keeping busy? I have. All right, good. I'm glad to hear it. Also joining us today, Dixon. Want to know who else is joining I us? I would love to know. Who From else. Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Uh, you have electricity, Alan? Yeah, we've had electricity this whole time. It's been very, very nice. <laughs> nice. You could have Unlike sent us this time last year when I was the one in the dark. So, so. Irene knocked you out last year? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, oh, it wasn't no. Irene. It was the the um, the, the nor'easter with the snow in October. Uh, right? With the snow in October, uh, it came in uh, right yes. uh, exactly <clears throat> a year a year ago uh, this past Halloween. It was the October 29th or thirtieth. Hmm. Remarkable. So uh, Sandy didn't do anything this year to you? No, we got some wind. We got a few twigs in the yard. It was really nothing at all. Wow, cool. I, I know it completely annihilated New Jersey where yeah, you we're, are. We're a mess. Completely. Not only, I mean, not only did it annihilate New Jersey, but it was associated with a full moon. So the yeah, full moon yeah. had a huge tidal effect. Right. Plus the, the whatever you want to call that storm, it was the uh, the, the weirdest storm ever seen on the Weather Channel. That's the frightening part of that for me. I, I was listening to the Weather Channel, and they said, we have never seen a storm like this before. You know, that's so years. So, Dixon, you're saying it was the perfect storm. Not the perfect storm, but it was a weird storm. Okay. And the ironically named Sandy, it comes in and takes all of the sand away from the beaches. <laughs> Sandy is appropriate for New Jersey because, of course, there's that Bruce Springsteen song. Right? I don't know that song, Vince. What is that song? Oh, come on. I, I don't know the song. You don't know Bruce? I, I know who that is. Right, let's bring in our other guest <laughs> before we continue. Right. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. You're remarkably quiet while we converse. <laughs> well, I wasn't introduced yet. Some guests uh, interject, but that's okay either way. She's you not, didn't have any wins out there in Michigan, guests. right? She's not guests. She's a family member. <laughs> right. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> we, had, we had a little bit of storm. It was clear that it was related, but uh, it wasn't bad. Right. Yeah, so we skipped TWIV last, year, last week um, because I Because you were huddled around a fireplace in a dark house. <laughs> yeah, That's I right. didn't have any power, and it was difficult to get in because gas was scarce. And um, We still don't have power today, of course, November 9th. So it's um, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11th day without power. Mm. So we don't have heat either. But we do have um, water. We do have a generator for the fridge and the freezer and a couple of lights. Wow. Um, and they're saying that maybe tomorrow, but they said most, most people by tomorrow, but there will still be individuals without power <laughs> beyond tomorrow. So. Quite remarkable. We'll the see. absolute worst part is when your neighbors get power back. Oh. <laughs> I, had, I can tell you that is that is the worst. <laughs> Alan, we had two buildings in Fort Lee. I live in Fort Lee, and, and we had two buildings that didn't get touched. They were on the whole time. And I go to school and they had generators. How could you have a generator for a building that big? And we're looking at them every single night saying, those dirty right here. Right here. Wow. <laughs> and now wow. they didn't want to share. They didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. It really made you feel the effects of what it means to be anti-big oil. Because this is all generated by the power companies, right? So not necessarily oil, but uh, it does give one pause as to... Uh, 
how much you're beholding to out there. So New Jersey was the uh, main brunt where the hurricane it, was centered over as it, it was came in. Katrina North. And um, Sandy is a song by Bruce Springsteen. The, the actual name is Fourth of July Asbury Park. Oh, well, I know that song. Sandy, the fireworks are hailing over Little Eden tonight. Oh, okay. Et cetera. Okay. Sandy. So that's Eden appropriate, don't you think? Go on. Yeah. So we got really hit. There were just trees all over the street. The, the poles are all down on our block. Right. Ah. The wires all down. Yep. And um, they, we were told we live in a sparsely populated area, so we would be dealt with last. They want to yep. <laughs> deal with the higher populated areas. That way they look good, right? Oh, we've got 95% of the population. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Well, also, yeah, they can, they can restore power to a lot more people in a much shorter time, yeah. so they want to get the, the yeah. bulk of the population. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. at one time there were over 8 million people without power. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. No, that's the size of New York City without power. That's amazing. What I found ridiculous were the gas lines, ah. and there's still lines. We we are doing even odd license plate rationing in New Jersey still. Yeah, and last week uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there were huge lines, hours and hours. Then they would run out of gas because there were no deliveries. Yeah, because the trucks couldn't get from where they had to come from. Right, and then just for a can of gas, you had to stand in line. There were fights, people yelling at each other, <laughs> cutting into lines. It's just terrible. That's, <laughs> so, for those of you who are just tuning in, welcome to this week in apocalyptic weather. <laughs> yeah, That's right. really. I don't. I don't you think really viruses are bad? Wait till you hear about. It. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were inconvenienced. It's not terrible, but I mean, it's just. Yeah. I don't understand why we are in this 21st century with wonderful technology. And we have wooden telephone poles with wires on them that can easily get knocked over. Vince, we yep. live in a patchwork society. Yeah. It's, well, it's add-ons it, all the time. It's because there's a big capital expense in burying the wires, and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. cheaper to just uh, ignore the problem until right. you have to rebuild the whole system. Exactly. So, Kathy, in Ann Arbor, do you have telephone poles still, right? Yes, we do. And, in fact, there's some yellow danger tape out in my front uh, tree lawn taped to the tree and there's a little wire coming down it's been that way i don't know for about a week <laughs> oh, i think you're gonna say three or four years <laughs> no i was i just i just noticed it i'd been out of town last weekend when i came back so i figured i'm going to give him monday and then i'm going to call and say what's going on right yeah so yeah we do have wooden te- telephone poles it's just amazing to me so they brought brand new ones in this week you know yeah, they yeah. put the wood you think so they, they would put, fall over again i mean if they had a metal or a concrete pole wouldn't that be better or well no? The, no, the correct way to do this is to bury the lines that's right yeah yeah right they should be underground but there's not uh i mean there's just it, not the funding to do that. do that but new developments will typically do that right yeah the problem is the new developments of uh, in fact around here it's a mixed community and their developments that went in in the past 20 years they all have underground wires but the wires leading up to those yeah. points <laughs> yes, so right. they got dark too they're right of course the new developments they cut all the trees anyway no trees yes. to knock them down they just clear cut so it's easier to build and so this this storm cost the northeast about 30 30 billion dollars now how much would it cost to bury the telephone wires I don't think it would cost thirty. Billion, I don't right? either, because the next time this happens, you'll spend another thirty billion dollars in losses. Well, look, our our entire block or street, which is about a mile long, you know, all the wires are down. They're putting new poles and and attaching wire. They could trench it, right? Of course, of course, yeah. they could do it patchwork. But they uh, they're just patching it up. All right, that's fine. Maybe next week we'll have power. Maybe. No. Anyway. Cross fingers. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was an interesting experience. I, I really never thought a hurricane would really hit us like that. But Monday night was pretty scary. You know, we were all in the basement and the trees are yeah. falling yeah. left and right. You can hear them crack, boom, wow. crack, boom. Wow. wow. And none of them hit our house. Man, we're so lucky. But lots of other places. Wow. But the wires, man, you know, they would hit the wire. The transformer would explode. Bzz, yep. bzz. Oh, you get these. Uh, Purple, yellow lights yeah, going off. We thought it was lightning for a while, but there was, <sighs> usually our dog gets really scared when there's lightning, and she wasn't scared, so then we realized it was... Transformers. No, okay. I'll post some pictures on uh, on the, this week's <laughs> show right. notes so you can see what it For your like. disbelievers out there that can't believe this is <laughs> no, happening. No, it's just an interesting... The street was such a mess. It was terrible. <laughs> just like Alan's last year. Yep. Okay, uh, now we have uh, virology, and uh, we have two cool papers today. The first one is actually um, very topical because it has to do with um, a discovery uh, for which the Nobel Prize this year in uh, physiology or medicine 
uh, was awarded. Yep. And we didn't mention this because this was for making for de differentiating uh, cells to become stem cells, basically. Are you aware of this, Dixon? Vaguely. So Shinya Yamanaka, he was one of two people to get the uh, Nobel Prize this year. Um, and that's what this, this paper is based on. But he found that you could put four transcription proteins, people call them transcription factors, but they're proteins, into cells, and they de-differentiate and become stem cell-like. You just inject them into the cell? No, he used the retroviral vector to deliver them. Uh -huh. Right, which is critical to understanding this next paper. Uh -huh. And this is a, so this is a paper that deals with this. So uh, he got the Nobel Prize for this, which is appropriate, because this is amazing that you can make stem cells and you don't have yes. to get them from embryos, right? You must have followed this, Alan, right? Oh, intensively. This comes up now all the time, these induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, right. So I, I, we've mentioned them in passing a couple of times on TWIV, I think, because they're, they're such an amazing technology. They, they have the properties of embryonic stem cells, but you can get them, you can take, skin cells as from somebody and reprogram them and mm. you get stem cells of that person which raises this whole new possibility of um you know maybe growing somebody a new liver that was made out yeah. of their own cells so they wouldn't reject it uh that's still a ways off but uh yeah the, the technology itself is really really cool and the fact that you only need four genes to do it um is really kind of jaw-dropping i know it's amazing i don't know how he how he came upon to do this, but it's really remarkable. Um, and so these can become, these stem cells, you can make them from any kind of fibroblast, and then they're pluripotent, right? They can become any yeah. kind of cell. Yeah, you can grow neurons, you can grow um, heart cells, you can yeah. turn them into whatever you want, Maybe. just by just by altering their uh, the set of growth factors that are associated with them. And you cannot, out, you cannot, you cannot outlaw the use of these cells. So not, right, because they're... <laughs> They're adult. Well, you could, but it, it would be pretty absurd. Uh, not that the other thing isn't, but um, right. yeah, they're, they're, right, not, right. <laughs> they're not derived from an embryo, That's which it. is crucial. Embryonic uh, stem cells, yeah. yeah. So uh, this paper is called Activation of Innate Immunity is Required for Efficient Nuclear Reprogramming. All yeah. right. So it's connecting. Uh, the production of these stem cells with innate immunity. And the key, as Alan said, is, is the viral vector. So, e And the authors are uh, Lee, Syed, Hunter, Ao, Wong, Makarsky, Pira, Yakubov, and Cook, from mostly from Stanford. And the only one I know is Ed Makarsky. Right. You probably know also is a herpes virologist. Um Using retroviruses is, is not ideal. Why, Dixon? Because they integrate into the nucleus. Good job. Yes. Yeah. So if you wanted to do this so that you could build a liver, as Alan said, you wouldn't want to use retroviruses because it might integrate somewhere and disrupt an essential exactly. gene or make a the tumor. The good news is you have a new, uh, a new liver. The bad news is it has cancer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You have a lot of new liver. <laughs> That's great. That's very good. <laughs> How would you like to wake up to that, uh, Alan? <laughs> So people have been trying to find out other ways to do this that doesn't involve uh, using a retroviral vector, right. right? And that's where this paper comes in. Um, right. And it turns out the obvious thing, <laughs> just injecting the <laughs> yeah. proteins, does work kind of, but really badly. Right. Yeah, the four proteins, by the way, are called OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK. CMYK is a famous one. Yeah, OSKM. Remember that four-letter acronym. Ask them. And they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> or Ask them. Ask them is what you need. What does that stand for, Vince? The, the four factors: OCT4, SOX2. No, the I, 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 ox. What, <laughs> what do the letters stand for? Well, they're transcription proteins. They have names though, no? OCT4. Oh, I'm sorry. I SOX2. Thought they, thought they named them after like. I, I'm sure those are abbreviations. Yeah, abbreviations. Yes. Exactly. Okay. No, that's, that's you know, I just for a complete that's explanation. Oh, like ox is octomer binding protein. Probably, See, that's right? what I'm saying. Okay. That's, that's exactly right. what Et cetera. I'm But we don't, we don't need to go into that. That's like obscure stuff. That <laughs> will get people uninterested in this wonderful story. All right. So in this paper, they, and I think others have found that you can put the proteins in. 
right. to cells, the four proteins, and you can also get the production of stem cells, but it's very inefficient. Right, orders of magnitude less efficient. So was, was this work predicated on the fact that when you examined what stem cells produce, these four proteins always come up? No. No. So they didn't have a hint as to how to. You said you didn't understand how they came up with this you know, idea. But. Alan, do you know how he he there came were, upon these four proteins? I I um, kind of touched a, skimmed through this story at some point. There were some hints that some of these were involved, and he started putting things in and getting some results that were suggestive. And and it was more or less one of these you just trial and persistent uh, types of efforts that eventually <laughs> narrowed it down to these four proteins that you really needed. Wow. I mean, basically, I think in, in uh, stem cells, they're very transcriptionally quite quiescent, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very different from most other cells. So they may have right. looked in, in these cells and gotten some ideas of what's produced or maybe when you induce them to differentiate what's produced. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know offhand. I mean, we could okay. find out, but okay. it's a good question, Dixon. Well, I just, you know. So one of the ways you can put the proteins in is by linking them to short sequences, peptide sequences that can get into cells on their own. Um, these are called cell permeant proteins. Without pinocytosis? Yeah, they get right through the membrane. Interesting. And the one I know originally is a VP22 protein from herpes simplex virus. Mm. It was, I think, one of the first discovered. You can just put the protein into cells in onto cells in a dish and it gets in and since then there have been other proteins there are quite a few other ones and it's a whole industry now based you fuse that sequence 11 amino acids with whatever protein you want to get into it cells right it'll, it'll get into cells it's how amazing about, how about that so they found in this paper that this works but as Alan says it's really less efficient than uh, using the retroviral vectors mm-hmm. alright so you get Less so, these four transcription proteins activate certain target genes in the host cell. So, they either assay those target genes, their expression, or the production of colonies, which indicate that you're getting these uh, stem cells produced. And with just the proteins, um, you've got very, very inefficient, um, let's call it nuclear reprogramming. Right. Then they made this big leap, which is really. <laughs> Interesting. They say, we hypothesize that an intrinsic feature of viral particles is somehow involved. Because remember, they introduced them using retroviruses. Right. Right. And I think they did, they did some gene expression profiling. Yes. Right. So they found that the, when, you, when you introduce these using retroviruses, you uh-huh. got one of these big gene profiles, uh, expression profiles, and you compare that with the profile you get when you just put the, uh, the proteins in with these cell permeating um, uh, peptides, and there were there were some differences in that that suggested maybe the virus was doing something. Right. Right. In fact, in the very beginning of the discussion, they say we serendipitously discovered a role right. for innate immunity, and our salient observation, the first one that they mention is a consistent difference in the temporal characterizations of gene expression between cells exposed to these factors, whether they get rival effect. V- retroviral vectors versus the cell permeant proteins. Mm. Right. So they made a um, th- an interesting experiment. I thought anyway, they made uh, a mutant of the vector that could not integrate into the host genome, and that right. was still very effective at uh, converting the cells to pluripotent state. So integration isn't needed. Right. So something about just the virus going in seems to be yeah helping. And as you said, they had. They looked and they found that a lot of innate res- immune response genes seem to be activated when they put these retroviral effect, uh, vectors into cells, like toll-like receptors, NF-kappa B interferons. So that made them think maybe <laughs> the innate immune response is important. Hmm. Right. So these are genes that are, that are turned on during an inflammatory response. Right. So the retroviral vector is recognized as foreign. Yeah, it's the RNA produced from the vector, most likely. Right. Uh, and that starts a whole program of innate responses, including interferon production. But the sensing is the first step of, of these vectors. So they said, well, maybe one of the sensor proteins, and they, they honed in on this toll-like receptor 3 pathway because this is the a sensor for viral double-stranded RNA. I think we must have talked about this before. Yeah, that's definitely come up. So basically, if you... 
knock down TLR3 or one of the intermediate proteins in the signaling pathway. So you put your four retroviral vectors with the four pro encoding the four proteins into cells. If you do that and, and at the same time knock down TLR3, you don't get good conversion oh, to right. pluripotent stem cells. Right. right? Directly implicating TLR3. Right. And they looked at some of the other pathways, and it's just TLR3 that's involved. And they show that, you know, the target genes, the expression of the target genes of each of the transcription protein requires TLR3, and also making these stem cells requires uh, TLR3, uh, which is amazing. So, Vince, do you think a virus-like particle would do the same thing without its uh, coding regions? No, I think, I think... <laughs> I just, well, I think you need the genome because you yeah. need the genome. That's what's triggering TLR three. It's right? not the protein. So you have to make the, RNA. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. That was a naive question. Um, no, it's fine, <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> you make good questions all the time. Uh, that uh, that we, means I had forgotten something along these. Paths, no, no, no. It's I fine. I, we didn't mention. It. There's no reason to believe that we, we we didn't tell you. So there's no reason to oh, know okay. that. Okay. Um, you can you can stimulate TLR three. With what are called agonists, right? Hmm. And one of them would be poly IC, which mimics double stranded RNA. So they did a nice experiment where they, again, they put the hmm. uh, permeant, the four proteins in a permeable version into cells. Remember, that transforms the cells to pluripotency very inefficiently. But if you put poly IC in, it's better because it's stimulating TLR3. So in the absence of a retroviral vector, you can substitute by stimulating the TLR3. So practically speaking, that's cool because maybe that points to a way to get away from using the retroviral vectors. Absolutely. Right. right. It's a much more surgical approach. Right. Which is Making really it, yeah, safer, potentially. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see, what else is important here to tell you? So we have a couple of cool reagents. Go ahead. One of, them, one of the experiments they do is with uh, a, a cell line that has the four protein, the pro four reprogramming factors in it um, that are uh, uh, docs inducible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they don't have to even put the proteins in, they're already there, and then they can, um, let's see, and that leads to figure six. Yeah. So um, they can do those same kinds of experiments um, with and without poly IC or with and without a retroviral vector that doesn't encode any of the factors it's just it's a gfp uh almost like an empty vector kind right. of thing hmm. right. so that's kind of that was a cool reagent uh, so the, the next step is they do a few experiments to try and understand what's going on so why do you need an innate immune response okay to get nuclear reprogramming to right. make these these pluripotent cells and they're starting with fibroblasts i'm, I'm yeah, start with fibroblasts clear. exactly which is a diff undifferentiated cell to begin with yeah, right. and, they, and they back them up. Even further. Yeah, so all the way to the beginning. Right? <laughs> so right. I have another question I'll save for later, but I want to come back to that point. So they then have this hypothesis that the innate immune response, triggered in this case by TLR3, is helping to open up the chromatin. This is a concept you must know about, Dixon, right? Yeah, yeah. So closed chromatin is transcriptionally sure. quiet, open. The you nucleosomes are over the coding regions, so it's this all, takes right. It so off. the DNA, the DNA, and much of the DNA in a cell gets packed into into a sort of storage form that's mm -hmm. compressed chromatin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then actively transcribed regions get unpacked so they can be actively transcribed. Right, yeah. and one of the signatures for the opening of chromatin is methylation of right. what Dixon histones. Correct. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it. Your, no, no, I almost your eyes it. were lighting no, up. No, I, I, I once knew this. <laughs> I yeah, methylation <laughs> of histones uh, is a so, and very specific residues of, of histones, and it, this is associated with opening the chromatin. So, in fact, they find that if they put uh, their retroviral vectors into cells, you, you, you're associating, you get associated histone methylation patterns, specific ones that they can look at by a variety of ways. So this is an epigenetic modification, right? Right. Because it's a linkage of a methyl group to, sure. to the histone protein. Sure. So they say, aha, signaling through the innate pathway <laughs> is opening the chromatin 
because we see these histone methylations, and that's that's what's associated with that. And in fact, histone methylation is carried out by a variety of enzymes, right? And they show that these are induced when TLR3 signaling occurs. Isn't that incredible. It's yep. like a Chinese puzzle. When you put it all together, it seems to fit very per- yeah. perfectly. Almost. So I think that's really the story that you have an innate response to the vector. The innate response helps to open up the chromatin, and that allows better transcription of the targets of these four proteins. Otherwise, ah. it's closed, and it doesn't work so well. Right. So it's really a fortuitous thing, right, that he used a retroviral vector? Uh, yeah, yeah. If he hadn't... No. That's right. <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. Wouldn't have worked, but he he might have gotten really inefficient uh, transformation, right? And maybe he would have followed it up and eventually figured this out. Because I, I read somewhere that every everybody missed this, right? Yeah. <laughs> All the key players missed this. And of course, so the one thing I'm thinking here is that this is, of course, totally accidental that the retroviral vector is opening up the chromatin to make this really efficient, but... What I found interesting is that the innate response leads to this, right? Right. So if you think about it, when you when when TLR three recognizes a pathogen, it's got to turn on the synthesis of a lot of genes, so it's got to open up the chromatin. Right. Yep. So mm-hmm. this makes perfect sense. And I really, <laughs> since I don't think about transcription all that much, I hadn't really ever. I mean, we work on innate responses, but I never thought of that. So I find this really cool. Well, and there's another there's another important parallel here too. Um, the process of reprogramming a stem cell is a lot like some of the processes that a cell goes through to become uh, tumorigenic. Mm-hmm. That's right. So what you're looking at here is the steps that a cell apparently has to go through in order to start differentiating and multiplying in a different way from what its environment would otherwise suggest. Right. Um, so that's a, a fundamentally important discovery. And this right. might be something that you could look at in cancer cell lines and, uh, you know, maybe eventually target. Yep. They have the last uh, paragraph is really a great summary. Innate immunity signaling appears to favor an open chromatin state, which increases cell plasticity in response to a pathogen. Hmm. We speculate that this state may enhance induction of pluripotentiality, Trans differentiation, differentiation, or even malignant transformation, as Alan just said, hmm. they call it transflammation. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know I like that. that. I'm not so fond of that. Yeah, yes. we'll see. Yeah. <clears throat> now, one thing they mentioned in the last in the discussion, which I wanted to point out, uh, they say silencing of endogenous retrotransposons is characteristic of the fully reprogrammed pluripotent state. So in other words, in, st- in these pluripotent stem cells, any endogenous retroviral-like sequences are silent. They're not, they're not made. And so I asked Steve Goff about this, because actually they, they cite one of his papers here. So in ES cells, embryonic stem cells, which are pluripotent, the endogenous, if you make them from mice, the endogenous retroviruses are silent. And I asked him why, and he said, well, pluripotent cells are generally transcriptionally really very different from all other cells. They tend to be quiet, but whatever is expressed is different. And so there's a lot of global silencing, and probably the retroviral DNA sequences, which are integrated, also got silenced along the way. And he says, you know, he, he's, he wonders why the retroviruses haven't evolved to, to evade that silencing, Right because they would like to replicate and spread. Right. But, so that's a question we don't know the answer to. So now I'll ask my question. Uh, you start with fibroblasts, which is a relatively undifferentiated cell to begin with in the body. Um, for instance, if you make two gene changes, you can take a fibroblast and turn it into a uh, striated skeletal muscle cell. It's not a big deal to do that. Okay, you mm-hmm. just knock out ID, and the next thing you know, you've got a muscle cell growing. Okay. So... How far down the line of differentiation can you go and get this system to work? Besides fibroblasts, can you do it with fully differentiated cells like nerve cells, like muscle cells, like pancreas cells, like uh, islet cells? Uh, How far down the road can you reverse it? I don't know how many different types it's been tried with, but I know know it's been tried with at least some quote-unquote terminally differentiated cells. Hmm. And it Mm -hmm. works? Uh, Yes. 
Wow. Yeah. So this this appears to be. I mean, I, I, again, I don't know how many it's been tried with, and there may have been some where people tried it and it didn't work, so it wasn't published. Right. Um, so there may be some preferences for what works and what doesn't, but um, mm. yeah, this appears to be a mechanism that you can just do. Are you looking wow. for? Are you looking for another brain, Dixon? <laughs> uh, some people would suggest that I could use one. Uh, no, 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 not another brain. Hey, so that yeah, paper. The, the, real point, the real point with iPS cells is yeah. you can use easily obtainable cell types. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. produce then a stem cell line from anybody you choose or That's any. Remarkable. That's mm-hmm. truly remarkable. And getting back to your earlier question, Dixon, it it looks like, based on knowing that if you could, if you fused cells together or if you just took nuclear material Ah, that would be enough to induce pluripotency and then it was known that certain certain factors were involved in that and Uh then they evidently narrowed in on those four wow wow so that's a very nice paper that was actually sent to rich by grant mcfadden who then i Okay, Rich is not here. I bet he would have liked to be here. Yeah. But I thought it was too cool to uh, put off. So It's very cool. All right. The um, second paper came out in PNAS not too long ago. It is entitled Provirophages and Transpovirons as the Diverse Mobilome of Giant Viruses. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that people are finally making their paper titles descriptive and approachable <laughs> to the general public. You know, there's too much use of specialized Oh, jargon. my God. <laughs> it's quite a title, isn't it? Your Honor, I object. <laughs> it is by De Nu La Scola Uten Fournu Robert Aza, Jardo, Montai, Campocasso, Kunin, and Raoul. Well, French and NIH. So this is um, the group that has worked on the giant viruses. Yes. Remember the Mimi viruses and all yeah, their relatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is quite interesting. Um, title aside. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> so we could start with um, <laughs> what their what their definition of mobilome is. Yeah, and mobilome is it has nothing to do with trailer parks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mobile genetic elements, uh, and they talk about roughly four classes: transposable elements, plasmids, viruses, and self splicing elements. So that's what they mean by the mobilome. Because, of uh-huh. course, if you have more than one of anything in biology these days, it has to be an, it's an ohm. ohm. It's got to right. be an ohm. That's right. right. Which is, of course, a Zen concept. Did you? <laughs> did I, anyone hear mobilome before? Have you ever heard that used? No. I yeah. had never come across it. Yeah, this is new for me. But apparently they, they cite a reference in using it. So I, I see. I think it may. Yeah, they do cite a somebody reference. Somebody else may be to blame for that one. <laughs> um, and they... The provirophage and transpovirons they've invented in this paper, as you will see. Do you think it's? I think it's transpovirons. I don't know if you, if it's made up. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? Trans- transpovirons. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's sort of the viral centric way, but I Trans- think it, it, transpovirons sounds like something you would adjust on your spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Back Kath- transpovirons. Kathy, could you say it again? I need to get it right. Well, I don't know, but I think it might be transpoverons. That's the problem with English. We don't have rules about where accents go. Oh. So. All right. Yeah. Transpoverons and... On any but, syllable you like. Provirophages. Right. Okay. And mobilomes. Um, so what they fa- have done here is to discover another one of these giant viruses. So to refresh everyone, and I think we've talked about all of these on TWIV. Um, the first is the Mimi virus, of course. And then um, th- shortly after that, another large virus. And these are large capsids with huge genomes over a million bases of right. double-strand Right, so their genomes DNA. are comparable to some of the smallest free-living micro- microorganisms. Right. Uh, mama virus was another one. And when mama virus was discovered, they found a virophage that could only replicate in cells infected with that virus. So this is, they coined the name virophages. Right. Uh, Then there is, um, and the hosts of these are amoeba, acanthamoeba, castellani or polyphagia, or is it phaga? 
Phager. Phager? Yep. Okay. Um, Sputnik, so that's one of the viral phages. Uh, <laughs> then another viral phage called Mavirus or Mavirus, <laughs> M-A-V-I-R-U-S, which we also talked about on TWIV. That right. was found uh, to require the Cafeteria renbergensis virus. So Cafeteria renbergensis are these protists, very numerous protists in the oceans. They're infected by this virus, uh, CROV, and they have a a, a, a virophage, and it's called Ma virus. And Ma comes from mariner because these viruses, these um, ocean, yeah. virophages had, no, not ocean, but they oh, have sorry. homology to a transposable element called mariner. Ah. <laughs> or right. map sorry maverick not mariner <laughs> i'm so sorry it's very confusing uh and then um is the third one uh the organic lake virophage i think we talked about that i certainly talked about it in my course so organic lake is an antarctic lake hypersaline they found the sequence of this virophage in it they don't know what the host or the the helper virus is but they assume because the lake is full of these large DNA viruses that infect algae, those are the ones that Jim Van Etten work on. They assume that this virophage infects them, but they don't know that. So three virophages, okay. I just got by email from my brother uh, a picture <laughs> of the Antarctic Lake, organic lake. Wow. Uh, and it's map location. So I'll send those to you. Cool. At some point. You must have yeah. told him we were talking about this paper, right? <laughs> Two minutes before the show started. Is he live up in, does he live in Antarctica? He has lived in Antarctica. Oh, yes. cool. oh my goodness. Yes. Oh, we got a letter so. from him later. Yep. <laughs> we get that far. Thanks. So anyway, the organic lake is a couple hundred meters. It's hypersaline. Uh, it's only about seven and a half meters deep. So. Okay. And that's why it doesn't freeze, because it's got too much salt? Uh, I don't know that it, it doesn't freeze, but... Ah. You said you said that it's pretty, you're probably right. Okay. So we have big viruses, and then we have virophages that infect only cells infected with these big viruses. Right. Now, I would like to register a complaint at this point. <laughs> just one? <laughs> Not just one. I don't have a lot. Now, the first sentence of the abstract, a distinct class of infectious agents, the virophages that infect giant viruses of the Mimiviridae family. This is not right. They don't infect the virus. They infect the virus-infected cell. Now, we all know what they mean. Uh -huh. But, you know, the press, the public, the lay yeah, press yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. has picked up on a virus infecting a virus, and they repeat it. I think we talked about this a couple yeah. of weeks ago. These authors are responsible for that. I didn't realize it. They uh, say it again later, whoops. demonstrating for the first time that a giant virus can be infected by another. Yeah. Come on. Do you, do you all harbor the same uh, problem Objection. with that, or you don't care? No, I, well, it's, we, we care I, deeply. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to notice, and I missed the very first one, but because I thought when I w whenever I was looking, they would say that they are replicating in the factories. Right. And so, because I knew you were sensitive to that, so I, I missed the ones that you pointed out. So the factory is right. It's in an infected cell. And in fact, this is not new. We have known for many, many years that there are helper and, and viruses and then viruses that depend on the helpers to replicate in the same cell. So that in itself is not new. But the idea that it's replicating in the virus is not correct. Yeah, I... How can it I see? I totally see where you're coming from, and I agree that it, ideally they would use the the better explanatory term that yeah. it infects uses this as a helper virus. But it it does kind of it is kind of a parasite of the larger virus. It depends how you what, what you mean. I guess <laughs> if you say virus, meaning virus infected cell, that would be okay. But I don't yeah. think that the are these writers. Let me get this straight because I am the resident parasitologist <laughs> here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> However, uh, lacking in knowledge, I am with regards to the viruses. But you've got two competing organisms for the same resource, which is the host cell. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So all it is is a competition for resources. Then does the little virus slow down the replication yeah, of the large virus? It does. Yeah. Okay. So it's. It's like an ecological setting inside the machinery of the host cell. It does slow down the big one. 
and the little one cannot replicate without the big one. So that one. means that it, it's not only not infecting the other virus, it's competing with it for the yeah, same resource. It's infecting the same So I, I think that's really a misrepresentation of the molecular mechanism. Now, does any of that change, because we're going to come up to this point in a moment, does any of that change if we're talking about a, a virus that integrates into the larger virus and travels along with it? Yeah, that's a good point. We can discuss it when we get to that, yeah. Because then that becomes yeah. a little more of a... It's a little dicey, but I think replicate is still a different thing. You know, integration is... Uh, let's talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so in this paper, they discover a new big virus, all right, and a new pro, a new virophage that, it, that infects cells infected with that big virus. Right. And the new virophage is called Sputnik 2. <laughs> Right. There was only one Sputnik, sorry. <laughs> the fourth virophage. And the virus is called lentille virus. And do you know what French, lentille in French means, Dixon? Bean. No. You're thinking of lentil. I am. It's not bean. Well, I don't know what it's it means. It's lens. I don't know what it means. It's okay. lens. <laughs> They isolated it from oh, contact lens fluid from a patient with keratitis. I and I would I assume that that's lentils are called that because they're lens-shaped. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Rather than the other yeah. way. Wow. It, so, Dixon, from contact lens, aren't these French clever? They are. Lentille, I think that's great. Lentille. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Because you name a virus from where it comes from. <laughs> it's came from a contact <laughs> lens. <laughs> but it's not a lentivirus. <laughs> No. Is not yeah. that could cause some confusion, right? Yes, that's right. So um, <laughs> this is great. I'd love to talk to the authors about why they did this. You know, it means that whatever you can imagine about life, life has already done. <laughs> so you know what I think happened? The person probably cleaned their contact lenses with water that's right. that was contaminated with, with amoeba, amoeba. That's right. right? And it and it had this then virus. You get the in keratitis. It. That's that's how all it right. Works. So they have a new big virus and a new. Um, Virophage, and they actually infect amoeba, and they show that the virophage replicates within the factories set up by the big virus. They do um, immunofluorescence to show that very nicely. Is it known that these viruses do or do not integrate into the amoeba's genome? I, I have not seen evidence of integrating into the amoeba genome, but thank you for the lead-in, Dixon. It's okay. Yes. What they find is that the okay. virophage... DNA, Maybe these are both double-stranded DNA, integrates okay. into the genome of the lentille virus. Uh, yes. Okay. So they show it by southern blotting and by sequencing. It integrates into the genome of the giant virus. So does it infect it? <clears throat> well, in the cell, it probably does, right. In yeah. the factory, right? That's probably where the integration takes place. Sure. So it's... You know, it's integrate. I would say it's integrating its genome into that of, because this is not new. You know, there have been some other examples of this. Right. I think he, Rich has mentioned a couple times. There's a pox virus with a retrovirus in its genome. Right. I think that sounds familiar. And then there's a herpes virus also with another virus in its genome. The, the two papers are referenced in this paper. So, I, I would say it's it's just integrating its DNA and it's a target for integration. Right. You know, if a retrovirus seem, uh, sees d double-stranded DNA, it'll integrate into it. Interesting. That's probably what happened. Yeah. Now, we don't know why it's integrating here. Uh, and they show uh, it very nicely in a classical method, the southern blot. That's yeah. in figure one. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was nice to see a southern blot in a paper. So, yeah. Wait Beth, a um, Dixon, do you remember southern blot? Of course I do. I'm from New Orleans. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? It's in the south. Um <laughs> I, I have another question, though, sure. and that is, <laughs> when these viruses replicate in the host cell, in the amoeba, don't you get two different virus particles? Yeah, you do. So doesn't the second little virus particle have the genome of the little virus inside? Yeah, it does. So yep. why integrate into the larger viruses? Yeah, the genome? Nobody knows. That's, That's a good, good question. That's a good question. Is, no, mm -hmm. Another question is then, in the larger virus, after replication, does every single viral particle contain the small virus as well? Or is it just partial? Yeah, some of them have the small particle within it and but some not of them all don't. Of them. No, I think it's kind of a random event. So it's not probably essential for the big one co infection. Well, it's essential. The co infection is essential for the virophage to replicate. 
Yeah, because you can and, purify and integrating those. integrating into the larger virus would drastically increase its chances of getting a co-infected cell. Well, that raises the question then: why eventually why doesn't it just do that instead of making little virus particles also? Then, yeah, it's a good question. It's a waste. It sounds like it's a waste. Does anyone well, like well, stuck in its old ways? <laughs> does anyone remember? Does every um, lentiviral genome have an integrated viral phage? I don't know if they could tell. Um, probably the southern blot would tell you that it's not, it's not equimolar. You could do it by limiting dilution. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember offhand. Yeah, I, d- I or, don't. You could I do it by ultracentrification. If you had the genomes, you could do it by in- ultracentrification. They did talk about um, the hot spot of integration right. and the presence of a further candidate integration site. Um, Suggests that it may insert in multiple possibly random sites, but right. yeah, I don't think they really address it. If every is if you found it in every genome, then maybe it's providing some function to the bigger virus, right? Right. So that's the question. Right. So uh, no. <laughs> these are these are <laughs> questions that <laughs> that you might not have raised, but I'm certainly going to raise them now. And that is that when viruses replicate inside host cells, they obviously uh, produce proteins which aid in, and abet them to do that. Mm-hmm. That's a general principle that we even had in Virology 101. So perhaps there's a cooperativity necessary here between the viral proteins that the genomes encode in order to allow them both to replicate. Is that known? I mean, what proteins I, does these genomes encode? Well, many, many, many proteins. Many, yeah, many. So that's the point. <laughs> I mean, Are any of those proteins... Uh, directly involved in affecting host factors. Uh, I'm sure. A lot of the proteins are, are totally novel. We don't even know what they are. Exactly. I mean, a lot of them are DNA replication proteins. They're helicases okay. and polymerases, but there are lots right. that we don't understand. So it's a good question. Oh. All, all I can say is that the virophage inhibits the replication of the larger, of the helper. Right. So I would find it difficult to believe that the helper needs the virophage, but it could be, right? Can't rule it out. They also find a, another um, piece of DNA in um, these big viruses, the lentil viruses. They find a about seven, seven and a half kilobase linear double-stranded DNA. And um, it has long inverted terminal repeats. And they say its it, it structure looks like a transposable element. So they call it the... Transposome. What is it? Transpoviron? Is that right? Or transpoviron? Transpoviron. Right. It's, because it's a transposable element, a transposon inside a, a virion. Virus, yeah. It's a transpoviron or transpoviron. But they took, they made it viron instead of virion because it's transposon, yes. right? Okay. Right. Very clever. They like making names in, in Marseille. Yes, do, this team is very into um, inventing language. <laughs> Is there something about tea in Marseille? <laughs> tea? No. No, that was the Shakespearean thing. The quality of... You're going to get letters, Vince. I know you're going to get some letters. Oh, is that pa- bad pun? Yes. The quality yes. of something. Well, well, yes. yes, of mercy is not strained. It's Marseille. Yeah, be. Marseille. That's Marseille, yeah. God, I, I knew there was Marseille in there. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, so these are transpovirons, and this um, is packaged in the in the lentil particles. Okay, mm-hmm. they also find it um, in- integrated into the genome of lentil virus. Right, so it can be packaged by itself, or it can integrate. Right, right, and it can also integrate into the virophage genome. Into right. the Sputnik. Sputnik. So I have another, and yet another <laughs> question now. What what part of the amoeba is the virus factory? Cytoplasm or nucleus? It's the cytoplasm. Yeah. Not the nucleus. Not though. the nucleus. No. Okay, 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 okay. Why did you ask? Well, because I'm curious. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's these are uh, large cytoplasmic <laughs> right. DNA viruses, All right. right? All right. So yeah, these are cytoplasmic factories, much like you see in pox virus infected. So cells. is the amoeba killed by the virus? Yeah, it is. Aha! In fact, these um, in Organic Lake, one of the ideas was that these viruses helped regulate the algal populations in different seasons. Right. 
So Vince, how yeah. would how would someone with a contact lens <laughs> yeah. have this as part of their culture? Well, because they used water. That yeah, was but where did the water come from? Tap water. Tap water. You Got said this came from a, a, an organic lake in South... No, not this one. That was a different one. Oh, I'm confusing. Sorry. I'm confusing. Organic <laughs> lake is a different one. I'm yeah. confusing. All right, all right. Yeah. I don't want to... This is a different virus, related, but oh, okay, okay. diverse, oh, okay, okay. different. I take it all back. It's very confusing, I, I know, but it's kind of... It, I think that's tap water, right? That has amoeba that, in it. Of right? course. Sure. But there are other acanthamoeba in this organic lake that these other ones... Infect. The organic lake, I think, doesn't have acanthamoeba. I oh, think it has mainly algae. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah. Algae. Phyco-DNA viruses that infect green okay. algae. Yes. Okay. And, and as far as I know, Dixon, amoebae are not algae. No, they're or not. Or vice versa, right? Correct. Okay. I, I know I learned something from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are chloroplasts involved in this somewhere along the line. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We'll have to do a podcast on that. <laughs> Those are other infectious agents, by the way. Transpovirons. Okay, they're not present in the amoeba. When you infect cells with uh, lenteal viruses, that is amoeba, the transpoviron seems to replicate. But if you just infect cells with Sputnik 2, the transpoviron does not replicate. So you need len- something from lenteal virus to replicate. Uh, this transpoviron. Right. So they think that maybe Sputnik helps transfer the transpoviron among bigger viruses, right? It's like a vehicle. So this transpoviron is mobile DNA, and maybe the Sputnik moves it around. That's their idea. So these, uh, they have now a lot of different Mimi Viridae isolates, 19 different Mimi Viridae. So they look at all the sequences... And they find transpovirons in Mimi viruses from all three. These these Mimis are put into three groups, and uh, based on sequence analysis, and they can find transpovirons in members of all three groups. So something it's real, yep, and it's out there. It's very cool. The transpovirons, Dixon. If if I said we have a seven point five kilobase DNA, this is a transpoviron. What one? pressing question would you ask about it what does that encode exactly yes brilliant <laughs> do i get something for this like a, <laughs> a glass of water a glass of water no thanks no. <laughs> never say that to a man over 70 you want a quid mug <laughs> oh i would love it didn't quip. i give you one i don't have it i would like a twip mug i don't we'll have a twip that. mug well we have to make one no but yes. that's an obvious question what does it encode sure yeah so it sure. encodes eight proteins, six to eight proteins. Six to eight? Because there are overlapping sequences with... <laughs> uh, something, like there's a DNA helicase that they recognize uh-huh. and a zinc finger protein. Yeah. But everything else they say, no homology to anything known on, wow. on the earth anyway. Interesting. So all new proteins. So uh, these presumably help it to replicate, but they don't know. Gosh, there's so much to do here. Yeah. It's really so cool. And wow. this is it. You go out there, you isolate new stuff, and you get more work to do. So. Sure. So why, though, why do we have to spend all that money going to Mars when we have all this wonderful material right here on Earth that we don't know about? Well, because everyone has good ideas about what kind of science to do. <laughs> yeah, and there, and come on, it's Mars. It's I'm really just, cool. <laughs> I, would, I think we should be able <laughs> to do anything. That's an awesome I'm, project. I'm begging certain questions here. Dixon, I understand, <laughs> and I think we should do any science that we want. Well, we don't have the money for we that. We should have the money. So we have to triage. We spent $4 billion on the campaign in Tell this country. We could use that to go to Mars. <laughs> we ended up exactly the same place as we were. We could put we our started. electrical wiring underground. <laughs> we could. <laughs> <laughs> this is all true. So their idea is the Mimi viruses, the virophages, and the transpovirons, transpovirons are all related. The, these sequences go amongst each other by recombination. They're mobile elements. So. There's a lot of work to do to figure that out. And they, they point out that this is not completely yeah, unprecedented. Right. They're, they're phage, I, I learned it as phagemids. They call them phasmids. Um, that, uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, um, so virus-associated plasmids in bacteria um, and apparently in archaea as well. So now that, that it's been found in a eukaryotic yeah. cell, now all three domains of life have, have these transposable elements that ride along with, uh, with or as viruses. Mm. Yeah. That's a very cool story. As far as we know, is this only the case when the larger host virus, if you will, is a DNA virus? 
Uh, hmm. As far as I know, yeah. Let's see. This. Um, I mean, I think all of these are. Yeah, the, p- the P4 DNA phage and the archaeal virus or, or DNA. Well, I wouldn't rule out RNA. Why not? Yeah. I was just we just haven't found it, right? Thinking about the cytoplasmic replication made me think, I don't know. But in, in the known, let's say the known mammalian DNA viruses, I, I'm not aware of any such transpoviron. Are you, Kathy? No. But no. would you notice, would you have, I guess we would have noticed it, right? Well, I, again, if it, if the cytoplasmic replication is a key, then maybe the pox virus is, is what. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that would be the place to look. Interesting. And, and I guess, hmm. I, I mean, intuitively, it seems like it might have to be a DNA virus to be able to get the kinds of integration events that you'd need for this, right? Maybe, yeah. But Unless, I wouldn't uh, rule out finding well, it in something uh, else. You could have a reverse transcribing RNA sure. virus, right? That yeah. might be able to do it. I just find, I just feel we're going to find these in other viruses where we just miss them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, but we'll see. So, yes, Dixon. This raises another interesting question. Of course, mm-hmm. so, so Mimi viruses that infect amoebae, you would assume because it has to have some receptor attachment. Uh, mechanism? Yeah, we would assume, yeah. So algae are quite different because they have cell walls mm-hmm. first. So that has a totally different attachment mechanism to get inside. Mm-hmm. And so we have no concept of how these get between host cells. You know, I asked Jim Van Etten that when I was out in Nebraska, and they don't know. They have wonderful pictures of these uh, algal viruses attaching to algal cells. Right. And there's even what looks like a portal and the DNA is going through really? it, but they don't know how it's attaching. Yeah. We're going to get him on TWIV, and he can tell us all about it. See if you can make that episode. You would like him. I'm sure I would. He's, a, he's about your age. <laughs> Decrepit. <laughs> no, not at all. So you could use a fluorescent green protein tracer to actually watch this happen. Yeah, they do. In real time. And they use green algae, so you don't have to put GFP <laughs> into them. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a ridiculous statement. He does plaque Even assays. Even I know the difference. Dixon, though. he showed me a plaque assay. It's a monolayer of cells, algal cells, chlorella right. they use. Right, yeah. Chlorella. And it's green. And right. then the virus makes these beautiful plaques. You don't have to stain the monolayer. There's a hole. There's Just a hole. holes. <laughs> sure. That's great. Sure. Have you seen these, Kathy? You must have, right? Seems like I have, but yeah. Yeah. I, it, have, yeah. I mean... It's just beautiful. Yeah, we'll have. He said he'd come back on and talk about it. But by the way, this has some practical uh, importance here Mm -hmm. because algae are becoming more and more important for producing biofuels. Mm -hmm. And contamination with one of these viruses could raise havoc with that industrial process if that ever scales up to that level. Well, and also, as they pointed out in one of their earlier papers, these viruses can have a profound effect on the ecology of. Of, of any ecosystem where algae or amoebas are dominant. I asked, I asked Jim whether these big viruses could infect people, these big algal viruses. And he said, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. <sighs> but Ooh. he said it in, in TWIV. He might be ready sometime later. Is that the deal? Yeah, I think so. Uh-huh. So we'll see. Stay tuned. Well, and I guess technically this paper is one that uh, indirectly... Yeah. One of these giant viruses infected something that was infecting somebody. Maybe. Hmm. Dixon, if you put an amoeba into your eye, what would happen? Uh, you get keratitis? No. Depends on the amoeba, doesn't no, it? No, 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 you don't, because you, you need a point at which the amoeba interfaces between some inanimate object and your cornea. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it becomes just a part of the lacrimal fluid, and then it gets ejected by your eyes actually watering. Uh-huh. If you trap it up underneath the lens, it comes in the form of a cyst. Right? It's a, it almost looks like a crystal. Mm-hmm. And then the heat of your body causes it to, to exist, and that's when it migrates, and it's trying to get out of this lens. It actually tried to, to get out of the lens, and that's why you get this, uh, this beautiful ring of keratitis that goes around where the lens actually interfaces onto the cornea itself. Okay. So that's, it, it doesn't erode away the uh, cornea, uh, between the two edges of the uh, lens itself. It's only at the edge. It's only at the interface of the edge and the lens that that's where the action is. So there must be something physical about its ability to, uh, mm-hmm. to do that. I just looked at the, uh, the organic lake photo that your brother sent, Kathy. <laughs> it's quite nice. 
How does that compare to the organic lakes on Titan? <laughs> well, I guess we'll have to go there. You know, the, more, the moment you said organic lake, I just thought about that. and Because there's lakes of methane on uh, Titan. That's and you think there any, is there good fishing there, Dixon? Uh, I doubt it. It would probably be ice fishing. <laughs> the, the ice is as solid as a brick. <laughs> yes. Let's do some email. Ah. Good idea. And I think, can, can Alan and Kathy split this, next, this first email from Matthias? Sure. Just start, sure. Kathy. Matthias writes, Dear TWIV team, first I would like to thank you for producing this wonderful podcast, which is as inspiring as informative. I am a frequent listener and always enjoy your insightful discussions about virology and science in general. I consider this outreach to the public of utmost importance, and I think you are doing a wonderful job. Due to your recent interest in and discussions about science behind the scenes, such as funding, publishing, and careers, I want to share with you my thoughts on some of the issues you raised. Since my early days in science, I've always been working in virology, which is my great passion, and I am currently in my third year as a postdoc. My interest in science was driven by curiosity about biology and my desire to explore the fascinating world of viruses. Threads to Collaboration in Scientific Endeavors In my view, science these days is becoming more and more a team effort. One of the major problems I see is that the administrative, political, regulatory framework has unfortunately failed to adapt to this new way of science. It still supports the lonely warrior attitude, where success and independence of any scientist is judged solely by the number of publications and the rank in the author list. Not only is this a non-scientific thing to do, but it also negatively impacts on willingness for cooperativity and collaboration. In addition, I always have to mention at this point how awestruck I am by how intelligent and well-educated scientists can stick to a measurement system that is so obviously <laughs> not a measure of scientific skills and success. Wow. Even though competition, as in many other systems, has its advantages, also in science, it has reached a level that might rather do harm than good. It is common practice that PhD students and postdocs are urged not to release information about their current research. Rather, there is often a made-up story for potential competitors. This practice prevents the important interaction with other scientists, which is imperative for reaching research goals as well as recognizing potential flaws prior to publishing. Uh, keep I going. Can, do you want me to pick go it up? Ahead. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, next, he talks about the postdoc trap. The scientific enterprise in academia, at least in many countries throughout Europe, is built on junior and senior scientists, technicians, and the relatively cheap scientific workforce of PhD students and postdocs. As you've discussed in your podcast, I also do not see the postdoc period as a job, but rather as a training period. However, in the current system, any independent scientist at some point has to be a salesman, a politician, or a and a manager on top. But not every scientist is a good manager, and vice versa. The problem I see with the current framework is if one does not want to does not want to or ha doesn't have the necessary skills to lead his or her own group, there's absolutely no perspective in academia. The postdoc position often becomes a lifelong temporary training period without any perspective. Uh, I think he means prospects. Uh, if funding ceases and the personal publication record is too short, many senior postdocs often have great difficulties making a transition to industry. This is one of the main reasons why so many of my fellow young scientists feel trapped or leave science at an early stage altogether. Uh, how the pressure on young scientists fundamentally changes the avenues of research. My idea of science at the outset was that any researcher is independently following his or her ideas to understand how a certain system works. Of course, this view was very idealistic, if not to say naive. The current measurement system of scientific skills, as mentioned above, puts tremendously high pressure on young scientists to produce a lot of results, and in particular the right results. Failure to achieve that goal will often have severe personal consequences. Many of my postdoc colleagues have thus turned into paper hunters, jumping from one topic to the next in order to collect high-impact papers that will eventually secure a more permanent position. Even worse, when there is an initial finding, discussions are immediately revolving around if there are some easy-to-do experiments uh, and if there is a high probability of publishing in a very high-impact high journal. Not uncommonly, a topic is dropped if that's not the case. This development I find very troubling, and my feeling is that this is not helpful for the advancement of science in any particular field. Not to mention that this pressure leaves hardly any space for healthy skepticism. I personally think these issues will not change until we fundamentally change the way we measure scientific success, or at least our perception of the value of the publication record, especially when assigning positions and distributing funding. Instead, we need to find other measures of individual contributions to the advancement of science. In addition, we urgently need a more flexible administrative and regulatory framework allowing the formation of research teams in academia. 
This is not an issue of increasing payment or reducing pressure, but many talented young sci scientists uh, will not stay if they're not given uh, prospects. I was extremely delighted that you picked up these issues on reforming science in the TWIV podcast. However, I found your notion that a major reform in science is not going to happen very discouraging. Mm -hmm. The fact that scientific enterprise has, has worked somehow despite these issues in the past does not necessarily mean that it worked well and will do so in the future. In fact, my impression is that many talented young colleagues are leaving science, even though they are persistent and would want to pursue it. If even well-established senior scientists don't see any hope, how should the next generation of scientists be encouraged? Uh, best regards, keep up the great work, Matthias. And then, P.S., I have to apologize for my lengthy letter. I tried to condense it as much as possible, so this is already the short version. Uh, I would have been briefer, but I didn't have time, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Moreover, I would like to stress that I am not sharing my view because of my personal situation, but because I consider these issues important for the future of science. Very thoughtful letter. Mm, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes really good points, and I agree yeah. um, that if even senior scientists are somewhat discouraged, how, how is the next generation going to be encouraged? I, I don't have a good answer for that. Yes. Yeah, I think, we were, I think we were a little pessimistic. Yeah on that show but you know we realistically these are going to be very very hard changes to do because the people who uh who are in charge of them are the people who benefit most from the current system yeah you know there's a there is a branch of science though in which multiple 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 authorships on a two-page paper <laughs> in physics um is very difficult to discern who did what Mm -hmm. Because it's so uh, intuitive and it's so um, dramatic that that spawns a, a paper of just two pages with formula that no one can understand except the people who authored that paper. You see these papers, you've got 30 authors on some of these things. What do they do for career development? And I think they have a way around it. And, and, and we should take a lesson from that. We should try to find out first. You know, if you work on the Super Hadron Collider and you've just discovered the Bose... Uh, Higgs boson. Uh, what does that mean for your career when 450 other people claim the same fame? Because they all had to play a role in this in order to get that machine to work. We don't have science that's done like that in 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 the field of biology too much, except for the Human Genome Project, where huge numbers of people were involved. Um, but mostly, it's like you know, it's <laughs> again, it, it is that single person coming up with. An idea that's, that's that's judgeable, based on other people's perception of how that idea actually arose to begin with. It's it's difficult to say who did what when there are thirty authors on a paper. No matter whether they divide the time up, you know, if they ask you to put the percentage of idea that you contributed to it. That's that's crazy, also. Yeah, I my but my impression from talking to a few physicists is that their job prospects are not particularly great. Either or they, they hang out at Brookhaven, and uh, you know yeah. they, they don't have too many places to go after that. I mean, yeah. So maybe they don't need to have that uh, kind of a prospect in order. By to the way, I just I just received a text from Rich. Um, yeah, I did too. Ha! Gives his current location, which is um, just offshore of Saint Augustine, Florida. <laughs> I bet he's fishing. <laughs> no, he's probably going to sail or something. <clears throat> yeah. Like, Does he give the temperature? I don't know, 10 or 15 miles out. No, he doesn't give the temperature. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, I don't... These are really good points, especially the postdoc. That's, yes. That's a tough one. Really that tough, is, that's because tough he's one. so right, you know. Yeah, well, it's a position that was originally developed to be a very short-term, temporary training or holding pattern type of thing, and it has right. become right. Um, a holding pattern for an entire generation of scientists. And also, whatever you do is crucial for getting a job. Right. Yes. Right? right. So it's not even what you did as a PhD student anymore. It's your postdoc right. that are so important, and that makes it very difficult. Yeah. Right? So anyway, thank you, Matthias, for yeah. that really nice uh, letter. We appreciate it. Oh, very much. Uh, the next one is from Stephen. Thanks for reading my overlong email on the concept of an academic entomology podcast 
in the all email TWIV episode. Of course, I expected the suggestion that I organize such a podcast myself. <laughs> the problem is that I meant the Vincent Racaniello and friends of entomology, at least partly literally. I'm a retired science writer and amateur bug photographer, and though I know a bit about entomology, I don't have access to the relevant journals, don't know practicing entomologists, and don't attend conferences. All of those, I think, would be necessary to emulate TWIV. The ideal leader of such a podcast would be an active senior entomologist or a recently retired one. I agree. I'd love to help get this thing going because entomology also fascinates me. Um, I know, I know a lot of them. It, it, would, it would have to be anchored by an entomologist, yeah. by somebody who's got some standing in the field. You know, we had one on our show in TWIP, by the way. Bob Guads is a registered medical entomologist. Yeah, he knows about all kinds of bugs. He, he knows all the people that are involved in the field. So maybe he could hook us up. And Tony James yeah. out in uh, UC San Diego is uh, a fabulous. Mm. So th someone who listened to this, um, to that episode where we talked about this, yeah. I mean, I said I'd be happy to organize it and facilitate recording and all. So someone mentioned it on, on Twitter, and then an entomologist actually said, I'm interested. What do I do? So we had a little email exchange, huh. and um, sh she huh. was going to think about it and never got back to me. So yeah. she would be very good. She She's probably, very active. She on probably got ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excuse the pun. Was that, was that bug girl? <laughs> no, it's, it's um, bug membracid or membracid. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think we're talking about the same person. It's someone who uses an alias, and yes. she said, I don't know how you'd feel about that, and well, I don't really care if you want to use an alias. But what would we call her? Hey, bug girl, you know. <laughs> but I'd like to do that. I think that would be fun. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Um, Buck. Buck. Yes. Hey, altruistic twivers. My name is Buck. I'm an entomology student at the University of Georgia, and this Friday I plan to go to Uganda to do a 10-day ant taxonomy course. <laughs> this will be in the Kibali National Forest, which I'm afraid is somewhat near to the developing Ebola outbreak. I'm certainly not seeking medical advice, but if it were you, would you be worried? <laughs> I shouldn't be coming into direct contact with many or any people, and I will be mostly out in the jungle anyway, so I'm not particularly concerned. What preventative measures might I take? I love the show. have been listening to it during many long hours in the lab since I discovered it earlier this summer. I particularly love the few mentions of the bracoviruses and parasitoid wasps, as some of this research has been conducted by an acquaintance here at Georgia. Thanks. Oh, this is so old. This is from June or July. So they've gone and come back already. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. actually, I answered him because uh, I said we won't get to this for a while. And I, I wrote it actually a little op-ed for uh, a website called Take Part. I basically said, stay away from carcasses in the jungle and don't go into a hospital where there are Ebola take, patients. Take your anti-malarials also. <laughs> why? Do you want him to get malaria? I don't want him to get malaria. Yeah, I'd be, I would be much more worried about the well-known vector-borne illnesses. Right. Get yeah. your yellow fever virus vaccine. In, in yeah, Uganda, yeah. in the jungle particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah don't yeah. get bitten by mosquitoes. That's what people Well, ha, ha, ha. But that has nothing to do with <laughs> Ebola. No, it doesn't. Uh, I think I have. I haven't done one yet, right? Have I? I well, did. did. It did. Yeah, so Alan turn. is next. I Thank think it's you. my turn. Alan. Uh, Allison writes, Dear Vince Rich Allen, maybe Dixon, and company. <laughs> I've been enjoying TWIV for years, but this is my first time writing an email. As a graduate student currently working in Ralph Barrick's lab at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, one of the best parts of TWIV has been to hear the voices of some of my former lab colleagues who have been guests on your show multiple times, including Eric Donaldson and Matt Freeman. Matt was the postdoc who took me under his wing when I was rotating in the lab several years ago before he went on to start his own lab at Maryland and taught me how to do so many lab techniques, including Western blots, cloning a gene into a plasmid, and transfecting cells. In fact, if he knew I was writing this letter, he'd tell me to quit wasting time and go back to my bench. <laughs> okay, you hear that, Matt? <laughs> I'm writing to thank you for including the perspectives of the postdoc panel in TWIV 194. I think that many people who are not scientists would be surprised to learn about how much uncertainty there is for success and advancement in science, especially for proficient and productive postdocs trying to make the transition to tenure-track faculty positions. 
if you do another postdoc panel in the future, it might be helpful for them to describe how they decided on where to pursue their postdoctoral research. I'm finishing up my doctoral work, or at least trying to, and thinking about where to go next is, somewhat, is a somewhat constant source of anxiety. One thing I was somewhat surprised by from the panel was that when asked what was wrong with the, <clears throat> what is wrong with science currently, none of the panel mentioned the financial compensation for postdocs. At one time, when postdoc appointments were generally shorter and seen as a specific form of advanced training and preparation for an academic career, the current postdoc salary scheme might have made sense. Not to be gauche about it, but as a as postdoc times become longer and publication expectations increase without tangible increases in specific career-related training, postdoc salaries have remained somewhat meager. To put this meagerness into some perspective, as a 23-year-old scientist working for a company with only an undergraduate degree and a few years of experience, I made roughly equivalent to the NIH minimum salary for a postdoc with four years of experience and a PhD. <laughs> I left that job because I wanted to be able to design my own experiments and pursue avenues of research that I was truly interested in. I've never regretted it, but at times I wish I knew there was a I knew that there was a better degree of financial stability in the future, both for salary as well as funding for starting a lab of one's own. Um, and then um, let's see. So there's a there's a pick here. Should we save yeah, that? Yeah, we can save it for later. Okay, sure. So we'll save the pick. Um, uh, is it tied yeah. into something else? Well, you could read the pick because it ties into okay. the next paragraphs. Yeah. All right. I'd like to suggest a listener pick of the week of the week. A brief video from an interview segment of the Daily Show from August first, twenty twelve. Uh, she links to it. The guest is Fred uh, Gutterell, executive editor of Scientific American. He's on the show to publicize his book regarding humans as the agents of their own destruction. <laughs> During the interview, he places viral research on equal footing with climate change in dooming the human race by designing our own extinction. Inciting the H5N1 viruses gener generated by the Kawaoka and Fouché labs, uh, Guterl and Stewart have this exchange. Stewart, the reason avian flu doesn't kill us is that it doesn't quite transmit well person to person. They created an avian flu that will do that. Guterl agrees, saying, yes. Of course, listeners of TWIV n will know this was not the conclusion from either of the H5N1 papers. Essentially, the interview bottom line is that our good intentions will be the agents of our own destruction. It was a very sad outcome, not at all what I expected from a popular science magazine editor, when a cogent argument could have easily been made on a widely viewed show to promote viral research instead of book sales on an alarmist topic. How ironic that this interview takes place only days after Uganda confirmed an Ebola virus outbreak, one of the viruses often evaluated for whether research is worth the risk of a possible lab release. Viral research has led to development of multiple promising therapies against Ebola virus, including experimental vaccines, monoclonal antibody therapy, and small, molecules inhibitor, small molecule inhibitors of entry, as you've all discussed on TWIV. It is unfortunate for the individuals currently infected that these therapies are not yet available as treatments. To balance out the pessimistic tone of that pick, what are your thoughts on this recent PNAS paper on stabilization of vaccines and antibiotics that could potentially make the cold chain obsolete? Um, she links to a paper. Apparently, group has figured out how to use a silk protein matrix that would keep vaccines stable even at the most extreme environmental temperatures. It seems a long way off from being incorporated into actual vaccines for market, but how great would this be? Cheers, Allison. Notice he's not the editor for Scientific American anymore either. He isn't? <laughs> no, there's a woman now who's the yeah. editor. Well, he's executive. I think she's editor-in-chief. Oh, okay. uh, I know who you're talking about because right. I see her picture in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Right. exactly. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate uh, that they came to that conclusion, but they they should have had you there, Dixon. No, they should They should have set him straight. Nah, I wouldn't have done anything like that. <laughs> um I think this cold chain business is really cool. We actually talked about a paper a while ago where they used sugars to stabilize vaccines also. You remember that, Alan? Mm-hmm. Uh, are you there? Am I? Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. Did you respond to my question? <laughs> I said yes. Oh, we didn't hear that. And this is very cool. We might do this paper. Silk. I, I think it will come to vaccines, you know, eventually. I don't know how long it will take. What do you think, Alan? It's a cool approach. I mean, does, I mean, it could take five to ten years to get into the market, right? The thing is, um, it's a huge demand, something like this. The yeah. downside is that it's huge demand from poor countries. Yeah. Uh, right. So this is not going to be a blockbuster type of break. Nobody's going to be making billions off of it. Um, yeah. But yeah. 
that I would expect, say, the Gates Foundation or the WHO or, or well, type initiatives to be all over. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines, I had the privilege about three weeks ago, the reason why I wasn't here, three weeks ago at least, of visiting the virus vaccine production unit at the uh, Texas A&M uh, campus down in College Station. And it employs um, a relative of the tobacco plant uh, derived from Australia, of all places, uh, because it's extremely uh, sensitive to bacterial infection. And that's the reason why they selected it, because they're easily infected and then later on transfected. Oh, so the point is that they're using plants to produce vaccines, and they can produce huge quantities in a very short period of time. And plants are easy to grow indoors no matter where you are. So locating these next to where they're needed most would be the best way to go on this situation. Of If you're worried about expense, you can cut it way down. And if you're worried about ease of handling the virus, you can get it and use it the same day. And the whole thing seems to fit nicely into a, a, yeah. a package that WHO would be more than willing to support. The drawback to that is that you would then need full staff and infrastructure that's capable of maintaining good manufacturing practices and protocols that would keep the vaccine stable and, and properly manufactured. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, you know, if you can train people how to drive cars in those places, you can train them this way, too, I think. I, I think I, they're totally capable. I just come across a lot of stories where there are problems at a pharmaceutical plant and in a production line, and they have to shut everything down, and this is in yeah. here. This is a very simple thing, though. I mean, I, I was there and saw it in operation, and I was incredibly impressed with how straightforward and simple the procedures were for handling all of the steps, basically. Right. So if you could, yes, if you could simplify... Um, that to the point that you didn't need highly trained staff mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have available everywhere that you wanted to go, yeah. um, then that might be might be a viable option. A lot of the steps were automated, so they, they had really simplified this oh. procedure. Quite that quite would remarkable. definitely help. Quite remarkable. All right, the next one is from Grant. <coughs> Hi, guys. Uh, this is my first email into TWIV. I'm a grad student originally from South Africa, now doing my PhD with Megan Shaw over at Mount Sinai in New York City. I found the story of the hot springs fascinating, and the talk of viruses in these environments was amazing. Despite not being much of a bacteriology guy, I found Ken's background, that's Ken Stedman, about extremophiles in the lab fascinating, using polyethylene glycol to keep cultures at 80 degrees centigrade, and then adding sulfuric acid <laughs> to get the pH down to 3. That's extreme science. I thought that was pretty cool, too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, listening to you talk about their metagenomic search for viruses in these volcanic spring samples sparked a question in me. Ken mentions that the samples are filtered with a 10 or 20 kilodalton membrane to get rid of everything cellular, and then the remaining solution is amplified and sequenced. Has anyone tried also sequencing the cellular fraction to see if the viral sequences can be confirmed there? In theory, that would confirm that they are infecting cells and add further credence to the evidence, or is this redundant, unlikely to work? Keep up the good work. Your podcasts regularly get me through marathon placking sessions <laughs> in the culture hood. And when I first read it, I thought it helped get him through the marathon. But <laughs> of course, there wasn't one this they year. They canceled it. Right. So my understanding from our discussion with Ken is that he has to get rid of the cellular fraction because it the noise, the sequence noise is too great, and then you can't pull out the viruses uh, in the midst of that. He actually mentioned that. Right. They tried, I think, doing a bulk sequencing initially, and it was too noisy. Is that, do you remember that, Alan? Is that yeah, clear? he was. But it, I, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if he was doing that because he wanted to get to viruses or if, if you went back with that already knowing the viral sequences – yeah. Could you then isolate those known viral sequences from the cellular fraction and maybe figure out what cells they're infecting? I don't know. It have to be integrated into the genome. Otherwise, you would never know if it's in the cell or not. Yes, right? you wouldn't be yeah. able to say which cell it's in. Yeah. All right. Kathy, it's your turn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One we've been waiting for. <laughs> yes. Bill writes, Hi, Vincent. First, remember that I'm Kathy Spindler's older brother, the mechanical construction engineer. We're talking about power plants, refinery piping, and that sort of stuff, although I'm tempor temporarily retired and now living in Boulder. 
Kathy introduced me to your podcast a couple of years ago, and I figure I get about 10%, and I usually listen again to the TWIVs, hoping to pick up another few percentage points. This is usually <laughs> while out running. So he listens to TWIM and TWIP, but for the TWIVs, he goes back to pick up percentage wow. points, I guess, with me. I listened to most of TWIV 195 today, up until you started to mention the one, that one of the PhD students in my sister's lab had gotten the TWIV bump. That was when my run ended, so I turned the podcast off. But this evening, I decided to look it up in the podcast and see what was said and what the emails were. I couldn't find anything and got confused. So I decided to listen to the segment where you mentioned the said student who got the twiff bump. Yes, Tian Wei. After listening to her name several times, I looked her up and uh, found her on Kathy's lab webpage. And I sent you, I'm sending you what's basically a technical confusion comment. And um, there was some confusion about where the letter, where the link went to in the letters and I couldn't even understand it from the email, but Vincent, you figured it out, and it was some web page linking thing, and you yeah, fixed that. I, I so, made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's referring now, uh, I, this was the episode uh, that we just talked about that was entitled, They Did It in the Hot Tub, um, and <laughs> also around the time of uh, Madison. So he said, uh, P.S. I went to a couple different Antarctic events and meetings in Madison in 2009, and I enjoyed the times there. I spent some time downtown, enjoyed the farmer's market around the state capitol building, but I didn't eat any of the cheese curds, <laughs> and I explored the Monona Terrace <laughs> and the environs on my morning runs. Once I jogged all the way around Lake Monona, and another time I enjoyed some beers on the UW Union Terrace overlooking Lake Mendota. Um, and uh, at one point, I looked up how long it was around Lake Monona. I think I decided it was around seven miles, but I can't find that anymore. Anyway, PPS, there's a hot tub on the back deck of the aquarium at Palmer Station <laughs> in Antarctica. When I was there, it was referred to as the tropical fish tank. A great place to unwind after a long day and look out at the glaciers and icebergs. So, And then he has a PS. Uh, I can... I can with certainty state one fact. I'm the only TWIV follower who has known Kathy Spindler all of her life. <laughs> and that's only true if my aunt and my uncle are not TWIV listeners. And I, I think that's probably true. <laughs> oh, he sends links to uh, South Pole stuff. That's cool. Did yeah. he work there? Is that... Uh... Yeah, so he wintered over several times at South Pole Station. And, wow. it, and he also spent time at Palmer Station as a civil engineer, construction engineer. So he oh, actually maintains those two websites um, there. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's a link to a webcam, too. Neat. Uh, so he likes these podcasts, I guess, right, Kathy? Yep. Yep. So That's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's end it there and go on to some picks of the week. Dixon... De Pommier. Vincent Reckon. Do you have a pick of the week? I do. I do. I, I pick the latest Nikon Small World winners for mm. 2012. They are absolutely stunning. Yeah, these are great. They are stunning. Even the twin little jumping spiders are yes. absolutely cute. <laughs> Hairy as hell. I'm not a, a fan of spiders, I have to tell you. There's <laughs> one on your back. They kind of freak me out. Oh, thanks very much, Vince. No. <laughs> These are baby spiders. They're tiny little spiderlets, but they're they're adorable. I mean, the whole the whole premise of showing you what the smallest part of the world looks like up close and personal. I just love that stuff. So that's my pick. You should submit something sometime, Dixon. I did. Oh, you did. Well, through Eric Grave, remember it was the winner. We won it. Was that the um, nurse cell? Yeah, that, oh, that's that was right. the the grand prize winner. That's the image on Twip. Yep, that nice. was the grand prize winner in 1976. Okay. Cool, excellent. It was long yeah. before we started podcast. I mean, I didn't take the picture. Yeah, Eric Grave took the picture, but I made the specimen for him. All right, that's cool. <laughs> did he give you credit? Of course he did. Excellent. No, we were good friends. All right, thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vince. Alan Dove. So I am picking a book that I just recently finished reading. Uh, it's by Jeffrey Lockwood, who's an entomologist. Actually, come to think of it, maybe we should contact him. Um, <laughs> the book is called Locust, The Devastating Rise and Mysterious Disappearance of the Insect that Shaped the American Frontier. And I found this absolutely fascinating. Um, the, um, in, the, in the 1800s, there were these plagues of locusts that would go across the prairies every few years, and they would blacken the sky. 
there were trillions and trillions of these insects. And uh, a researcher at the time actually calculated the size of one of these swarms in the late 1800s, and, and it was hundreds of miles across. It was just, it was covering the whole Midwest, practically. It was just this massive, massive amount of biomass. And he goes into some depth discussing the, the ecological impact that this would have had all these insects consuming all this vegetation and and they had a they had a biomass that was roughly equal to the bison <laughs> right um, b- before buffalo bill so it was just this amazing natural phenomenon that of course caused massive amounts of crop damage and yep. spurred the first major um, government federal government intervention in in agriculture which, of course, has become a long-standing and problematic national tradition. But this all dates back to the locust problem. And then in the, in the late, very late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the locusts stopped coming. Hmm. And the, there, there are still periodically outbreaks of various grasshopper species, and people refer to them as locusts, but they're not really. Yeah, those are different species, and they don't get nearly as large in swarm size. They don't do nearly as much damage. The Rocky Mountain locust that used to that that had this enormous earth changing presence on the planet yep. simply vanished. Yep. So did the buffalo. Well, right, but we know why the buffalo vanished. Well, maybe they're linked. No, that was an early theory, and so this this fellow um, decided to try to figure out what happened to okay. the Rocky Mountain locust okay. and. He did. He came up with, <laughs> ultimately, he came up with a really, really good, totally plausible theory that all, all the facts fit into. But it, the history of this and the, and the scientific quest that they go on to try and find out what happened to these, to these insects is really interesting reading. Mm. Yeah. S- Laura Ingalls Wilder writes about yes. the locust humming in, on the banks of Plum Creek. Yes, and uh, it caused that. them to move. Right. Wow. Didn't this so. uh, s- uh, settle where Brigham Young was going to stay? Yes, because the, the locust- seagulls came in and ate them. It changed the entire. It, it altered and directed the entire history of the settlement of the West. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. So what, wait a minute. You're you're not uh, you're not going to give away the punchline. I take it. Yeah, I no, I tell you. What. <laughs> and there's and there's at the very end of the book there's a little twist. Okay. Mm. Yes. And notice that on, I'm, I'm at the Amazon page at the, the moment. Virus did it. <laughs> and uh, there's an advertisement for Pixar short films. They probably picked up on Locust and <laughs> gave you Pixar because one of their movies was about grasshoppers. Yes. That would be, um, what's the name of that one? Ugh. Jiminy Cricket. No, no, no. I forgot. Uh. So life. Was uh, a bug's life, right? A bug's life. Bug's sure, sure, sure. Uh, Kathy, what do you have? Well, I have a link to this uh, really cool digital encyclopedia about the American influenza epidemic in 1918-1919. And uh, so it, it started out as a smaller project, and they uh, document 50 different communities um, in the United States, um, have all kinds of uh, things here online to look at. Uh, it's put together by some library people and publishing people and uh, collaboration with the University of Michigan History of Medicine Center and the uh, uh, U.S. CDC. So I just thought it was kind of a nice uh, compendium of things about the epidemic in the United States. Mm, they have a nice uh, image library, too. Mm-hmm. If you need pictures of people with masks on, Mm-hmm. It's cool. Nice. I hadn't known about this. No. Yeah, I think they just kind of released it. Uh, we got something about it October 22nd. So Nice. So this is at Michigan. It's housed, yeah, on Michigan servers and so forth, right? I think, yeah. This is, this is quite, a, quite a trove of stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Neat. I just searched for my name, but I'm not there. <laughs> I searched well, for Palazzi, too, and he's not there. No, but young. you weren't there in 1918 and 1919. Yeah. But yeah. Palazzi made the virus. You know, he recovered it. So yeah. you should think he would be there. That's right, but yeah. this is this is historical telling yeah, the story. Know, that happened actually then. <laughs> you know, let's see. Talbenberger is not there. <laughs> he's, uh, he's cited. He's acknowledged. 
Okay. When you go to the uh, that part of the page. So. <clears throat> uh, that leaves me. My pick is an article from the New York Times, Wednesday, November 7th. It's called, As Dengue Fever Sweeps India, a Lackluster Response Stirs Experts' Fears. It's by Gardner Harris. And it is about something which is new to me, that there's probably a heck of a lot more dengue in India than we know about, and uh, they're not doing a heck of a lot of, a heck of a lot about it. So the official numbers are that... In 2011, there were 18,000 cases of dengue in India. This year, so far, there are 30,000. But officials say there are probably 37 million dengue infections occurring every year in India with 230,000 hospitalizations. And they think there's a lot of of, um, subclinical infections, that is, infections without any symptoms or mild symptoms so that you never find out that it's dengue. That's pretty huge. Big. So they say here, if you go to India as an adult, you have a reasonable expectation of getting dengue after a few months. If you stay for longer, it is a certainty. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So anyway, it's a pretty cool article. Give you the an, an idea of the extent of the problem there. And the photo is this water area in New Delhi. They say, filthy standing water abounds in New Delhi. And of course, the mosquitoes like to breed there, right, Dixon? Yep. They do, but... Not this, that much. The, but the kind that spread dengue yeah. breeds in temporary bodies of water. So are you saying that the New York Times screwed up here? Well. It says it's an ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes. Maybe yeah, well, it's an ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes, but maybe not the one that carries dengue. Yeah. They don't because say the, the one, dengue mosquitoes. Yeah, the one they? that carries dengue is an Aedes uh, mosquito. It's a tree hole breeder. Hmm. Right, so it likes it likes uh, house and, gutters and that's right. tires, counter, uh, cups and cans. tire tracks. Not and, not this. Well, there's a lot of debris, uh, garbage. There is. There so is. maybe there are cups that have water in no, them. No, no, I think they were just trying to show squalor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we have that right here. We do. We didn't have to go to India for that. All right. Our listener pick, of course, is from Allison, and you heard that one already. And... Um, do, you can find TWIV, as usual, on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and at twiv.tv. If you are new to TWIV and you like it, go over to iTunes and rate it or make a comment. That helps us to stay very visible there. iTunes is still the best collection of, of podcasts out there, and so it's important to stay very visible so that we can always get new listeners and spread the word about this, this very interesting thing called a virus. We love to do that. Um, we just had our 3,000th like over at our Facebook page, oh, oh, oh. facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. And in fact, the individual celebrated it. He said, um, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, where would that be? A like on messages or notifications? I know people who can use 3,000 likes in a single sentence. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, wait, wait. I want, I want to tell you who it is. Okay, is that a message? No, I don't think so. Cody Cobb posted, Huzzah, Twiv fan number 3,000. 1.16 1 <laughs> p.m. On, on November 7th. Cool. I think that's cool. Cool. Very, very cool. And for uh, our 10,000th fan, we'll give you a Twiv mug. So start cranking them up. <laughs> That's right. Facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, where you could see pictures of the devastation in my neighborhood, by the way, which I've been posting there. And thanks, everybody, for wishing us the best. It's really nice that you uh, made the effort to do that. Send us your questions and comments to Twiv at Twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier can be found right here at Columbia or at, let's see, medicalecology.com, verticalfarm.com, and trichinella.org. Thank you for joining us, Dixon. It's my pleasure, as usual. And are you going to start a new podcast on urban agriculture? It's possible. It's possible? It's possible. I'd like to. I think people would love it. I would like to do that. All right. Kathy Spindler is... At the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. As always, this is a lot of fun. Hope you get your dangling wire fixed there. <laughs> yeah, in front of my house. Yeah. It's nothing like a dangling participle. <laughs> More dangerous. Or maybe it's not as dangerous. Who knows? Yeah. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. 
and no downed trees for you. I'm, I'm glad you're happy about that. Yes, I'm very, very happy about that. And by the way, you know, there's a silver lining to this. You have a fireplace, right? I do. <laughs> you, you are set for firewood for <laughs> years true. to come. Just get yeah. yourself a good splitting axe and That's you'll right. be fine. Too bad you're not a cabinet maker. <laughs> no. Because yeah. you have a lot of wood out Yeah, there. I understand, Dixon. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not going to make cabinets, <laughs> I, though. That's too much no, work. No. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>